There we go. Great. Live from the beautiful and virtual Jonas Center in Novato, California, KRCN is on the air and presents the Rotary Club of Novato meeting hour. Thanks so much, Roy. That was a, a very informative uh, and uh, we're, we're uh, thrilled that you're in Rotary Club of Novato and we can't wait to get to know both you and Brenda a little better uh, from those you know, megapolises of uh, Spokane and Kokomo. Uh, we will have to learn all about those communities. So thanks, thanks much. Uh, Gary Brayman, would you please introduce our speaker? Well, thank you, Chris. I, I really am looking forward to, to Dan speaking. Um, there's really an awful lot that I could tell you about Dan, but I, I wanna speak fairly quickly and make the introduction short, but we really wanna make sure to realize what a quality person this is. Um, so I'm gonna make my introduction pretty short. Dan is the executive director of the Family Farm Alliance, and they're an organization up in Southern Oregon who advocates for farmers, ranchers and irrigation districts. Um, he represents these organizations over 17 Western states, quite incredible. He's well-educated. We could talk a lot about his education, but with advanced degrees in petroleum engineering and a master of science in water resources. Dan is a Rotarian and is a board member of the Klamath County Rotary Club, and that's in Klamath Falls, which is in Southern Oregon, of course. Many of you will know that. We truly have an expert on one of the West's most serious problems. Uh, and I put in parentheses for my introduction, water in the, in the West. It affects every one of us, but with farmers, ranchers, it's just simply is life. Um, the papers have been full of articles this last week, last month, last year about this subject. And in capacity as, as an expert, Dan has testified over 20 times before con congressional committees and his group has testified for another 60. Our speaker Rotarian, Dan Keppen from Klamath Falls, Oregon. Dan, thanks so much for coming to see us. Hello, fellow Rotarians, greetings. Uh, I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Stand by. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to find the share screen option. There it is. Okay. Everybody see that? There it is, Dan. Okay, great. Everybody can hear me okay? Sure can. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I, I wish I was down in the Bay Area. Um, I, I lived in California, I lived in Davis, and I lived in Chico uh, for most of the 90s. And in fact, the, the last job I had, I was at Northern California Water Association, which represents the senior water right holders and the, and the rice producers in the Sacramento Valley. At my last year, year at, at, at NACWA, um, I worked for the Bureau of Reclamation. I was a special assistant to the regional director who was a guy named Lester Snow. Uh, that name may sound familiar to some of you. He uh, ended up um, becoming the uh, water resource department director under Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, Anyways, at that time in 2000, 2001, I was there in the regional office of the Bureau of Reclamation when they made the decision to shut down the Klamath Irrigation Project for the first time in 95 years, uh, which I'll talk about in, in my presentation. And um, it was really uh, uh, because my parents had just moved to Klamath Falls, uh, you know, about 10 years before that, I sort of became a liaison between the regional office and, and Klamath Falls during that crisis year. And I got to know a lot of the irrigation district managers and the water users. And that fall, uh, they had an opening to uh, fill the executive director position for the Klamath Water Users Association, which represents all the project irrigators up there. And I ended up getting the job. So I moved up in, in November, 2001. I've been up here since 20 years this year. Uh, I hung around in that job till 2005. And that's why I have all this gray hair. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was a it was a really a rough time and dealing with a lot of conflict in, in our community. Um, in 2005, I kind of hung up my own shingle and I, I've got my own consulting firm now. And I serve uh, my biggest client is Family Farm Alliance. So I, I serve uh, as executive director for the alliance under contract. All of our uh, we don't have any employees. Everybody works under contract. We're a very lean organization. And um, Family Farm Alliance is a group that was formed in California back in the 90s um, to advocate for irrigated agriculture in D.C. The whole idea was to get farmers and ranchers on the ground face to face with policymakers in Washington. So um, in the time uh, since the mid 90s, when we were formed sort of the San Joaquin Valley, along with Arizona producers, we're actually an Arizona nonprofit corporation. Our membership has expanded to all 17 Western states. So. Uh, the delineation line there between sort of the, the gray shaded colored states and the, and the colorful colored states, uh, that's roughly the 100th meridian, which is um, seen by many as sort of the dividing point between what's the wet part of the United States, which is the eastern part of the country, and what's the arid or drier part of the west, um, which is where, where we're at. So we have members in all of those states, and our mission statement is all about finding ways to protect and enhance uh, their water supplies um, working in Washington. So we work very closely with um, Congress and whoever's in the White House. I feel like we're really bipartisan and, and that's evidenced by our, our track record. We, we, I actually testified two weeks ago before the House Water, Oceans and Wildlife Subcommittee, which uh, Jared Huffman, your congressman just north of you, uh, chairs um, that subcommittee. That was my 25th time I've testified and the 85th time for the Family Farm Alliance since 2005. So I feel like we've, we've got a pretty good record because we're seen as problem solvers. And my board is all farmers and ranchers. My advisory committee is irrigation district managers and attorneys and economists and association uh, of managers, people like that. So anyways, that's the background of, of Family Farm Alliance, an organization I'm very proud to work for. Uh, but I'm going to take my Alliance hat off uh, for today and talk about what's happening here in my neighborhood, Klamath Basin. Um, uh, as Gary said, uh, lots of stuff in the news. I, I've, I've actually spent most of this week dealing with media. We've, uh, at one point this week, we had CNN, Los Angeles Times, uh, and the Associated Press all in Klamath interviewing folks. And um, there's more lined up. So... Uh, honestly, I wish I was a little bit more prepared. I'm, I'm going to do my best uh, today, but uh, not a lot of time with the, all the media presence in our, in our community um, this week. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the background, you know, sort of the, the, uh, what the, where, where we're located, the history of our irrigation project, the challenges that we've had in recent decades, and then focus on the crisis this summer and, and, and possible solutions. So uh, Klamath River watershed basically straddles the Colorado Oregon state line. Um, I actually have a let's see here. Let me get my highlighter out, uh, laser pointer. So here's where I live, right there. This is Upper Klamath Lake, which is the largest surface water body in Oregon, uh, about 75,000 acres, but it's very shallow, um, only about six foot average depth. It's called a hypereutrophic lake, which means it's got lots of nutrients in it in part because the, the bottom of that lake, a lot of it is Mount Mazama, uh, which blew up uh, thousands of years ago and created Crater Lake. Uh, those volcanic uh, um, sediments are high in phosphorus and nutrients. So this lake's got, it's nasty. It's got lots of algae. I used to live on it for seven years. It's not really good water quality. Um, the drainage area up here, there's some major rivers that come into Upper Klamath Lake. Uh, there's a dam that regulates the lake levels on the lake and diverts water out into the project. And then the Klamath River flows all the way out to the Pacific Ocean and empties into uh, the Pacific south of Crescent City. Largest tributary is the Trinity River. And uh, there's a tie there uh, to California because there's a diversion that goes from the Trinity over to the Sacramento River, Clear Creek and the Sacramento River. And part of the Central Valley Project, uh, the Federal Water Project in California, gets a, a small portion of its water out of our watershed. So the, we're tied together there. Um, the irrigation project that I'm gonna talk about today uh, was authorized in 1905 under the 1902 Reclamation Act. Um, that was legislation which sort of carried the priorities of the time uh, of a nation, which was they wanted to settle the West 
and they wanted to create irrigated agriculture to build rural communities and also feed a hungry nation. And so uh, the Klamath Project is one of three of, of the first projects built under the Reclamation Act in the West. Um, this is a picture of the eight canal head gates completed in 1907. Um, and really in its, the first you know, 40, 50 years, it was considered to be you know, a resounding success. Uh, it built out to 200,000 acres, which is close to where we're at today. Uh, by the early 1940s, uh, producing food, providing water to the refuge system, and, and supporting some really strong uh, rural communities, and and a really vibrant uh, recreational uh, economy with with the with the hunting associated with the wildlife refuges. Um, this is the project. Um, so the state line is roughly right. It's right here. So this is California. This is Oregon. Um, here's Upper Klamath Lake. There's a You've probably seen in the papers, if you've been watching the Klamath situation, there's head gates at the A Canal where there's protesters out there right now. That's right there. And then this water, this canal system uh, serves this entire area out here. Uh, and then the water makes its way back into the Klamath River and goes downstream towards the ocean. So the irrigation project is right out, out here. And it's some of the finest farmland in the world because it's old historic lake bottom uh, soils. Um, so the types of things that are grown around here, there's lots of pasture um, for cattle, grass and alfalfa hay, grains, uh, potatoes, onions, garlic. Um, we have mint up here that's used for oil and tea and toothpaste and horseradish. Uh, my best friend is uh, the second largest horseradish producer in, in the whole country. Yes. Um, the crops here are really known for their high quality because of the, the soils that I mentioned, but but also the climate here, we're at about 4,300 foot elevation. Uh, so it's a high desert climate. Um, it gets, we get lots of sunshine, unlike most of Oregon, which, you know, the Willamette Valley is kind of seen as this, you know, very, lots of rain, a lot of cloudy weather. Here we're called Oregon Sunshine City, Klamath Falls is, so we get lots of sun. And the high elevation means we have sunny, warm days, cold nights. Sometimes the temperature will change 40 to 45 degrees, you know, in one day. And that, I'm not a botanist, but my farmer friends tell me that creates incredible proteins and, and even things like alfalfa, which are high, you know, highly sought after on the West Coast. So uh, we also have a lot of beef and dairy cattle associated with the pastures that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Klamath Irrigation Project is extremely uh, efficient in its water use. And that's primarily because we have a big um, sort of a recycling and reuse component. So a farmer may take in water on the upper portion of his property. It'll work its way through the soils down to the bottom of his property or her property. And the tailwater, oftentimes portions of that are recovered and, and they're, they're recirculated. So um, sometimes a single drop of water will be used between six and nine times by the time it now makes its way through the system and gets back into the Klamath River. Um, and our project gets a, a, a lot of attention. Um, it's because we have the federal nexus. It's a federal, federal project. So that provides opportunities for critics of, of irrigated agriculture to use federal laws to try to hamper those operations. And that's been a challenge over the last 20 years. Um, but the reality is 3% of the total runoff in our 10 and a half million acre watershed is used to irrigate all the land up here. It's a pretty small percentage when you look at the entire watershed, 200,000 acres out of over about 10.5 million acres. Um, this is Upper Klamath Lake. Uh, it's the primary storage project. Um, it was built to, to originally to provide enough water to take care of summer needs for all the irrigated lands. And that, that worked that way for, for decades up until really the early 90s. Um, the Klamath project is a single purpose project. The water was stored exclusively for the use of irrigation uh, on the Klamath project back in the early 1900s. And as I said, uh, that worked well for 95 years, even in times of drought like we're having this year. Um, this year, we're gonna get uh, no water. The irrigators are gonna get zero water. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and again, back in the early 90s before some of the, the regulatory issues came uh, about, uh, we used over 400,000 acre feet of water in a year like this. And, and, and folks scrimped, but they made it work. They cooperated with their neighbors, they made it work. Again, there's drought this year. I think the inflows are about the lowest in, in probably 40 years um, into Upper Klamath Lake. But uh, again, in the past, we've had 
similar situations. We pulled 400,000 acre feet of water out and, and, and things worked. There was no environmental catastrophes or, or anything like that. Uh, that all changed in 2001. Uh, and again, this year we're basically having, you know, deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra said, same situation that happened in 2001 is happening again here in 2021. And the, really the main reason for this change is, is you know, societal priorities have changed. Um, back in 1988, two uh, species of sucker were listed under the Endangered Species Act. And both of these uh, fish um, uh, inhabit Upper Klamath Lake and some of the, the streams uh, adjacent to the lake. Um, when the fish were listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, there was no mention made whatsoever of the Klamath Project being a stressor to those species. In fact, probably the number one stressor was the state of Oregon had a sanctioned snag fishery where they encouraged people to snag these fish out of the lake for decades. Um, once the fish were listed uh, and that practice stopped, the numbers doubled the next year, but the, the suckers have been struggling uh, since for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, so soon after the listing, even though the project wasn't identified as a stressor, the Fish and Wildlife Service had to be consulted by the Bureau of Reclamation to make sure that endangered species uh, were not being uh, jeopardized. And the tool that was used to avoid jeopardizing those fish was keeping Upper Klamath Lake at a, at a set level at certain times of the year. So in terms of irrigation supplies, that's a constraint, right? Uh, that uh, same sort of philosophy happened in 1997. So the coho salmon were listed on the Klamath River in California in 1997. Those coho are located about 60 miles downstream from our project. And there's, there's several hydroelectric dams owned by Pacific Power that are between us and, and those coho, but they were listed. And at the time of the listing, again, irrigation project was not identified as a stressor to those fish. Shortly thereafter though, once the listing was made, the National Marine Fishery Service had to be consulted. So Fish and Wildlife Service has jurisdiction over freshwater fish. National Marine Fishery Service has jurisdiction over anadromous fish, fish that spend part of their time in the ocean, part of their time in freshwater like salmon. Um, so you got another agency coming up with requirements for the Bureau of Reclamation to follow to avoid jeopardizing the coho. In this case, they said more water needed to be released out of the Klamath Project to elevate flows to help the coho. So that started in the late 90s. And what you essentially had is, say you have a bathtub, which is Upper Klamath Lake. One agency is saying, you gotta keep the water at a certain depth. Another agency in another state is saying, you gotta let more water out of the drain. Well, those conditions kept, from the water user standpoint, became more and more restrictive. And, um, and at the same time, tribal interests were exerting their federally protected fishing rights, which were somewhat similar to the, to the arguments that were being made by the fishery agencies to, to, to protect those fishing rights um, using the stored water of the Klamath Project. So what happened is in 2001, you had one agency, National Marine Fishery Service, saying, here's the water you got to release out of the project, higher than ever before. Fish and Wildlife Service is saying you got to keep the lake at a higher level to protect suckers higher than ever before. And when you put those two requirements on top of each other, that year, which is a dry year, there wasn't enough water in the system to take care of the biological needs, let alone provide water for the farmers. So the farmers got their water completely shut off. It was announced on April 6, 2001, first time that it happened in 95 years. And some of you uh, who were around back then uh, may have remembered it was in the national news. Uh, um, it took a long time for the local community to sort of draw national attention to their cause, but they did. Um, and it really, I think a lot of the country uh, uh, was very sympathetic to our people because they, they, honestly, they couldn't believe that, that the needs of fish were more important than the needs of farmers. And, and so one of the ways that they drew attention to their cause was this bucket brigade um, 17,000 people lined up in the streets of Klamath Falls and symbolically passed this empty bucket down the street. Um, that brought in media attention from around the world. At the time, this protest was the largest protest in, in, in peacetime uh, history of Oregon. Uh, that's, that's changed here in recent years, but it was a pretty big deal. There was only 50,000 people in our entire county and 17,000 were in the streets that day. So what that did, I'll go back here, is, is it drew in lots of political attention, including the George W. Bush administration. And um, 
uh, Gail Norton, who's the Secretary of Interior at the time, um, uh, at, at the water user's urging, asked for an independent peer review of the science that was used to uh, essentially shut the water off that year. And there was two um, reports that came out. I'm sorry, I'm being a little awkward here with my slide presentation, but um, uh, two reports came out uh, issued by the National Academy of Science, which was outside scientists that came in that had really no, you know, um, uh, they, they were truly neutral. And one of the concerns that we had is we felt like a lot of the science scientists with the agencies and some of the conservation groups and the tribes um, were biased in, in sort of their approach to the science on this. And so we asked, the, the secretary asked for this report to be done. They came out and um, uh, basically said that the science that was used to justify those higher lake levels and higher flow levels that took water away from the farmers wasn't justified. And of course, that was a, a huge deal. Um, and, and so, you know, unfortunately, that was 20 years ago. And um, we here we are 20 years later, and the, the, that focus is still in place. I, I can't say it's been happening every year because we had a hiatus in there from about 2006, 2005 to about 2015, where settlement discussions were underway and a settlement was developed that kept um, uh, folks working in a cooperative way and allowed the water to sort of be divvied up for a 10 year period. But that settlement failed to get authorized by Congress in 2015. I'm gonna talk about that here shortly. And um, what happened is basically everybody's gone back to the way it was when I first got here, suing each other, you know, battling scientists, uh, competing legislation. Um, it's, it's everybody's sort of in war mode now. So. This year, um, we found out in May that there, um, uh, again, all of the water that's out there coming through the system is being dedicated to these biological pinions for suckers and, and coho. And this will be the first time since the project was built in 1907 that there'll be no water going through the A Canal, which means about 150,000 acres are going to get no water through the project. There's some groundwater pumping going on right now, and I'm looking out my window. It's pretty green out there, but another month. Um, it's going to be dry because these are emergency well permits that have been issued. And I've talked to many people who say basically it's a race for the bottom right now. People are just trying to apply water to try to get at least one cutting of alfalfa in. Um, that is not a sustainable thing. And so we're going to have a lot of uh, dry, dusty acres here this summer. So it's really um, unfortunate. Uh, we know what's going to happen this summer because we saw it happen in 2001. Uh, farmers have mortgage payments, property taxes, assessments to irrigation districts, equipment payments. They got to take care of their families, most of important, most importantly. And and when they don't have water, they don't have products to sell, and and it makes it really tough to take care of their families. And when I came here in 2001, it was tragic to see what people were doing just to try to to keep their their livelihoods going and, and to bring home you know you know bring home the bacon for their families. Um, one of the really things, that, things that's really concerning is some of our producers have contracts with really, really important clients. So, for example, I don't know if you all know In-N-Out in California. Um, the French fries that In-N-Out makes come from uh, producers here in the Klamath Basin. Uh, so these producers have, have contracts with Walmart and, and, and Safeway and places like that. They've been, you know, they've worked years to achieve those things. And if they can't deliver on those contracts, they lose them. Those folks are going to go to Washington State or somewhere else. So it's a real, real concern um, from a business standpoint. Um, one of the things I'm seeing, not just here in Klamath, but throughout the West, is drought's so bad. Uh, there's not a lot of forage out there because we haven't gotten a lot of rain and snow and, and you can't irrigate. Hay is in short supply. And so prices have gone through the roof on hay. And it's like the, the folks that have the deepest pockets are getting the hay. And some of those folks right now are in Sacramento Valley, um, uh, uh, dairies down there. Um, uh, my boss is, is a cattle rancher on the Wyoming Colorado state line. They're liquidating part of their herd. They're selling their herds uh, early because um, uh, there's just not going to be a market and they don't have the forage to take to support those, those, those herds. So that is a huge hit because it takes a long time to rebuild those, um, to, to rebuild those numbers. And now with all the, the cattle that's being let off to the market soon, the prices are dropping. So it's kind of a, a double whammy. We're going to lose a lot of uh, a lot of workers this summer, 
And uh, a lot of a lot of these folks are really, I mean, valued uh, members of our communities, uh, especially the smaller communities like Malin and Tule Lake, where where Gary's um, niece lives. Um, our project generates about four hundred million dollars in economic activity. It's one of the huge drivers in our rural economy. You shut down ag, and there's going to be a ripple effect. And so it's seed and equipment dealers, obviously, ag service companies, fertilizer companies. And then it moves all the way to Main Street. We saw this happen in 2001. I was on, I got on the board of directors for our Chamber of Commerce that year, and they did a survey. Uh, that was the year of obviously 9/11 and some other things where the, the market took a hit. Uh, here locally, 75% of the business said the biggest impact on their loss of dollars was the water shutoff. The thing that's different this year in 2001, our community was really sort of uh, all unified, and you know we had 17,000 people in the streets. This year, I'm sure some of you have seen, um, we've got people out at the head gates and they're tied to Eamon Bundy and um, sort of anti-government folks. These two folks here on the upper right-hand corner are, are getting lots of press right now. Um, uh, when you look at the people that are showing up at these protests, they get about a hundred of them, you know, one day out of the, out of the week. Uh, usually there's just a couple people out there at the head gates, but you know, they're, they're threatening that Eamon Bundy is going to come in with his folks and forcibly open the head gates to let water into the project. Uh, most of the irrigators uh, don't buy that, and that's why you won't see very many irrigators out there. But they're very upset that they're getting lumped in with these anti-government people. The people that I represent, that I work with, are out here every day trying to stay alive, trying to find alternative water sources, or working out deals with their neighbors trying to help out the National Wildlife Refuge, which is gonna probably have a major botulism outbreak because of lack of water. Um, and that's the story, that's the tragic story here, but these yahoos are getting all the, they're sucking up all the air on the news. So that's a lot of the time we've been spending with the media lately is trying to get them out to talk to the real people that are being impacted. So just want you all to know down there, these two characters don't represent uh, very much of our community. Good. <laughs> um, so here's the other things that we're going to see this summer. We saw it happen in 2001. There's three species that are being protected under the Endangered Species Act with all this reallocated water. There's 430 other species that rely on water in the canal system, water on the field, and water in the refuges. And that's not going to happen this year. When you talk to the old timers up here uh, from 2001, that they'll tell you the thing they remember the most that summer was uh, deathly quiet at night. You don't hear the tick, tick, tick of the, of the sprinklers. You didn't hear any birds, no frogs, no nothing. I mean, there's nothing out there right now. And, and that's going to be the case all summer long. Um, this is a picture I took back in April, believe it or not, on top of a ridge between the two wildlife refuges. That's a, a farming down there next to the refuge on the Tule Lake side. That looks like a beautiful rainstorm coming in. That's actually dust. <laughs> uh, that's a Jacob's uh, ladder coming through the dust in the air. We were up about four or 500 feet above the valley and, and you, there was dust in our mouth. We were with folks from Ducks Unlimited on a tour back in April and it was that bad then. In another month, it's gonna be this way, I think, you know, all over the place up here in Klamath County anyways. And again, the wildlife refuges up here, um, when you look at terms of priority right now, the ESA gets the water, irrigators gets what's left after that, the refuges get what's left after that. And before all these listings, there would be enough water. It would come through the farm system to go through the refuge. This is what it looked like in a normal year. It's one of the most critical um, uh, uh, waterfowl areas on the whole Pacific Flyway. And this year, Lower Klamath will have no water. Tule Lake Refuge, uh, the farmers are working to get water set up in one sump to, to avoid a major botulism outbreak. So this is what the refuge normally would look like. This is what it looked like two days ago. This is CNN interviewing my buddy, the horseradish grower, out there uh, in the Tui Lake Refuge. It's down to just a trickle of water. And what they're doing is uh, the farmers are working with the irrigation districts to move that water into a bigger area where the ducks can congregate and, and be safer. Um, uh, that's a story that CNN fortunately found interesting to, to cover. Um, refuges will get no water this year unless it's somehow done with groundwater coming from the farmers that are pumping groundwater. Other impacts, there's 1,800 wells in Oregon alone that are, are within the, the, right along adjacent to the A Canal. 
believe it or not, those shallow wells get their recharge from a full aqua, a full canal. And so with canal recharges gone, we're going to see a lot of shallow wells drying up and we're already getting reports of that happening. It started last week. Um, and then, um, you know, there's just, again, there's going to be some groundwater pumping going on on top of that to take the place of the lost surface water that will just exasperate that, that, uh, that problem. So we've got some challenges here. Um, right now, our local community has really strong objections to the fact that the water that was created for their use that they paid for, you know, over the last hundred years has been reallocated to meet these fishery needs. And then what's tragic right now is there's no correlation showing that that water has benefited either coho salmon or suckers in the last 20 years, no correlation whatsoever. So that's sort of the tragedy here. Um, there's a lot of other stressors out there, obviously that are affecting coho and salmon. Um, and so really right now, um, that's a legal argument, you know, that, that's gonna have to be hammered out. I'm not sure the courts can do it or not, but it's in the courts right now. It's gonna, in my view, take some sort of a settlement to ultimately resolve all this stuff. So, you know, the government basically is saying, we gotta take that stored water, send it downstream, uh, keep it behind the lake. Um, and what's happening right now is there's water going down in the summertime that's much higher than probably that existed before this project was built, which again is another legal problem that, that needs to get hammered out. This is a photo of what it looked like before the project was built. And what's interesting here, and it's, I, it's complicated, you almost have to be up here to, to see it, but before this project was built, there was a series of natural basalt dikes that controlled how water moved down the Klamath River. So Upper Klamath Lake was backed up by a dike. Uh, the water would have to get to a certain point, and then it would spill down into the Link River, go down to Keno, where there was another reef that would have to get up to a level to spill down that reef to get down into the Klamath River. Until that point, the water would back into Lower Klamath Lake, which is now farmed area. And there's studies that show back then there's probably more water that was lost to evaporation and evapotranspiration in those marshes and, and, and that, that shallow lake system than what's being used now by the crops. Uh, again, another sort of a technical issue that needs to be dealt with. So what are the solutions? It, really, we've been saying this for a long time. The National Academy of Sciences said this. You got to focus on everything that's affecting the fish in this watershed, not just the easy knob to turn, which is the, the federal knob of the, of the, the nexus that, that the Klamath Project has because it's a federal a project. Um, and, you know, honestly, like I said, the fish aren't benefiting after 20 years of this. And the farmers this year are, are hurting. We're gonna lose, we're gonna lose some of our farmers this year. They're not gonna be able to survive without any water. The long-term solutions, we need a lot, we need a settlement. That's the only way to, to, to deal with this. The courts are not gonna handle it. That's like somebody wins, somebody loses. We need an agreement that deals with water and fish and farmers and tribes and fishermen and a fair and legal treatment of our project, which we feel isn't being dealt with right, right now. And we got to have the states, California, Oregon, and the federal government and our local community on board. And this is something that's been done. It's been done elsewhere. And it's been done here. So I, I'm going to talk real quick about the settlement that was, de that was developed back in 2010. What happened is after the shutoff of 2001 for our project, and in 2002, there was a big fish die off in the Klamath River that really hurt the tribes and the fishermen, commercial fishermen. People finally came together a couple of years later, just as I was leaving water users and said, let's try to settle this stuff. And so the tribes and, and the fishermen said, we want those dams out, the hydropower dams that Pacific Power runs because they're, they're affecting fish passage and, and hurting habitat. And the irrigators said, okay, well, if you take those out, we wanna have continued affordable power. So get, find a way to help us with that. And not only that, we want improved water certainty. We can't, we can't there's no way to run a railroad every year, getting what's left over after biological opinions are taken care of. And so the tribes and the fishermen came back and said, okay, well, we'll do that, but you need to reduce the amount of water that you're using in the climate project. And with the dams gone, we want to reintroduce salmon up into those areas beyond the dams, up into your neighborhood, and we want to restore that habitat. And the irrigators came back and said, okay, well, if that's the case, we're willing to take a reduced ag water demand in exchange for certain water supply. If we know how much we got, we can manage that. But we also want regulatory assurances that we're not going to have more of the same if we have salmon now, you know, swimming by our farms. 
that was the beauty of the, the two agreements, the Klamath Hydropower Agreement and the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement, which were signed off in, um, in let's see here, in 2010. And um, uh, what the agreement said basically is Congress has to authorize this by 2015. If it's not done, uh, everybody can has an off ramp and they can go back to fighting each other like they used to. Well, unfortunately, Congress did not pass that. And a lot of it had to do with conservatives concerned about the dam removal. And I would say, uh, yeah, the, the dam removal option or issue was the thing that really got a lot of Republicans sort of hung up. And it's too bad because the increased water supply certainty that we would have gotten through this agreement, um, if that was in place right now, we'd have 300,000 acre feet of water for our farmers. Instead, we got zero. So um, I was asked to sort of, you know, maybe comment on this Potter Valley project in your neighborhood, which I know it provides part of your water supply and how that relates to the Klamath settlement. Um, the big difference is, you know, this is a water supply reservoir. The dams that are coming out on the Klamath have nothing to do with water supply. They're, they're re-regulatory reservoirs that are, were intended to, you know, maximize power production when demand in the California grid was at its highest. And Pacific Power now with all these fishery requirements, they have to let water out of Iron Gate Dam to meet these fish requirements. Uh, plus, you know, the, the relicensing requirements associated with, with taking out those dams, they just said, you know what, we're gonna go ahead and take those dams out. Um, and, and the irrigator says, okay, we won't oppose that if we get this certain water supply as part of the KBRA agreement. So I guess, you know, it's interesting. I think some of the same players are involved with this. I know the Karuk tribe is involved with sort of advocating for removing um, uh, this dam. Um, and the Karuk tribe is very involved with, with the settlement and the dam removal process up here as well. Uh, the big difference I see is, you know, you've got a water supply there that could be impacted. And, you know, it's been done in the Sacramento Valley and elsewhere. You can take out some of these dams and replace them, place them with screen diversions or something. As long as you keep your, your water supply is whole, you know, and you can find a way to help the fish, great. I, I don't know enough about this, um, but my observations from the outside is that's the biggest difference is you've got water supply at stake here uh, as compared to the Klamath situation. The dams that are being uh, looked at for dam removal have nothing to do with irrigation water supply or, or you know, even M&I supply. So uh, in the near term, we're working hard with the federal government, with both uh, Congressman Bence, LaMalfa from California, and also uh, Congressman Huffman to come up with a relief package that helps uh, the fishermen, both tribal and, and non-tribal, and the farmers up here who are getting hurt, just to get a Band-Aid on us so we can sit down and start talking. Um, and that's the short-term things. There's, there's one of the main things we're trying to deal with here is to get dollars to take care of those domestic wells that are already starting to dry up. And we're getting a lot of help from our state on that right now. So in the bigger scheme of things, look at this. This is like one of the worst drought maps I've ever seen at this time of year. And um, it, it's as bad as it gets. And you guys down there are in that um, exceptional drought designation. So are we um, up here in Klamath. And uh, we have lots of members down in this area too, which is, which is really, really dry. So, you know, the only silver lining out of this horrible dry, dry drought year that we're having is it's going to, you know, it's gonna shine a public and political recognition on uh, what's happening. And I just hope that out of this, we can get some sort of reasonable regulations that support farmers uh, who are taken for granted, in my view, um, and support the need to, develop new water storage where, where possible, and then investing in rural communities, including water infrastructure that's really been sort of ignored over the last several decades in many parts of the West. So uh, I hope that's not too long. It's probably like drinking from a, from a fire hose um, for y'all, but uh, it's, uh, Klamath isn't easy. <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with y'all and I'd be happy to, to take questions if we have time. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we're almost running out of time, but uh, if you don't mind, we'll carry over for another five five minutes or so. If you'd stop screen sharing, I'll get the, all the folks back up on the screen and, and identify who may have a, a question. Uh, we'll go to gallery view and um, uh, yeah, Alan, go ahead. Uh, unmute yourself first, Alan. Yes. Um, <clears throat> 
I uh, had an experience fishing on the lower Klamath and <clears throat> talking with the Indians there. And, and they, uh, they, they have a, a great uh, viewpoint on, and, you know, they rely a lot on the fish. Um, the, they talked about tearing down these hydroelectric dams. Has that happened yet? Um, no. So here, here's what happened there. So remember I told you how the deal came together? Really, it was sort of an exchange for the dams coming out um, and a lot of dollars for restoration that would help salmon and, and suckers. Um, the irrigation project would get a smaller supply, but they'd know March 1st of every year what that would be. Um, then 2015 and rolled around, Congress didn't act, and so everybody went off on their own off ramps. The good stuff associated with the settlements from our standpoint went away. The dam removal is on another track now, and it's in both Oregon and California are on board with that. And I believe this administration, the Biden administration, probably will be too. Um, so they're geared up. I think they're shooting for 2023 to start removing those dams. There are there's some litigation out there right now as well. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a sure thing because nothing's sure, but but that actually has more momentum on it than the other parts of the settlement, which were you know really important to my community. Does that answer your question? Thank the you, thing, the thing that I that I learned from them is that it's not just water; it's in the a, a native a native uh, stream. It what they do they call it scrubs the uh, uh, the riverbed, and uh, the, it it allows uh, deep holes along the the stream for for you know hatching and 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 they call them reds but uh if if they're never never cleared up the only deep hole is right right underneath the dam <laughs> and then it gets overpopulated yeah I thought it was interesting the way <laughs> so i'll we're, say we're I mean, there's, there's, there's differing uh views on you know sort of you know, the, the, big, the big argument up here is the stored water that's in the upper Klamath Lake. When you, when you look at it right now, it's, it's okay, but in another month, it looks like living pea soup. I live right across the street from it. I mean, it looks like pea soup that's got organisms in it, algae and stuff. You can't tell me that that water is helping fish. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, big, a, a big argument, especially in the summertime when historically the flows were very low in the river. Another theory I've heard is the flows were so low that the high temperatures in the sunlight might have actually had a beneficial effect in, in killing things that hurt the fish. So, I mean, there's a lot of theories on that. I'll just say all of us, the tribes and the irrigators, want these fish to recover and, and flourish because that helps the tribes, it helps the fishermen, and it gets the regulatory uh, uncertainty off our back. But we're a long ways from that right now. Other questions for Dan? Um... Well, we got them on the line. We don't get an opportunity to hear uh, hear this story, uh, nor uh, interface with uh, somebody who's so familiar and schooled in this. It, so, uh, Gary, go ahead. Gonna have to unmute. Get, Dan, get, I got to get unmuted. Dan, one of the issues is how the press handles. This yeah. is certainly a compelling story. I've heard the story over and over from friends that you and I know in common, and you, you've made it very clear that it's a compelling story for the farmers, but everybody else is involved. What's the press do to you? Well, that's a great, a great question. So first of all, I want to put a plug in for your lovely niece. And um, uh, Laura is part of a group that set up a website called uh, Shut Down Fed Up, and they put it together last year. To me, it's the, it gives you the most sort of honest sense of what the producers are going through. And these are the same people that are out interviewing, you know, getting interviewed by a lot of outside media. Um, it's been generally what happens is um, when the media comes in, you know, if it, if it bleeds, it leaves, right? That's how you sell papers is with, with crisis and, and tragedy and conflict. And what's happened with the early coverage this year, a lot of it has been focusing on the folks out at the headgates, the, the, the Bundy crew, um, also racism, 
Um, there's been charges of racism, a lot of it that happened like 20 years ago during the shutoff, but that's getting a lot of, of coverage. And then um, there's uh, been a die off of, of juvenile fish on the Klamath River, which is something that happens every year. I don't want to minimize it, but that's getting a lot of coverage as well. Um, so it's sensational, right? Uh, the, the media likes to focus on sensationalism. And um, for us, honestly, I mean, I'm biased, but the folks that are, that are suffering the most this year are these, these small family farms that are, are, they need this water to survive. And it, it feels like their story has been overlooked until just the last week and a half or so ago. And, 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 and you got a small group of people here that are really working hard with the media to get them out to show them the refuse, to show them their dry fields, to talk to people whose restaurants may go out of business, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then ultimately, we got to be thinking, what's the, we got to keep our eye on the prize. What do we want? We want everybody to recognize that the only way out of this is for people to put their differences aside, set at the table, and try to hammer out an agreement. And right now, there's not a lot of trust because of some of this media coverage early on that's got people pitted against each other. So, uh, Gary, does that answer your, your question? I mean, that's sort of what we're wrestling with right now. I think the coverage of CNN story was excellent. That ran, it was a lead story on CNN last night. It was excellent. Very balanced. Thank so you, Dan. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to put the presentation together and to share uh, that story with us. It's a, you know, one basin example of what's going on throughout the Western United States everywhere including in our own backyard. Each one has a little different circumstances, but there are so many competing interests for uh, water in, in uh, the West that it's, uh, it really takes uh, a, an enormous amount of effort to accomplish anything. My hat's off to you for uh, originally crafting the settlement. I'm only hopeful that uh, not only and a settlement be found again, but that the congressional leaders uh, will be able to compromise and to accept such uh, settlements going forward. Uh, we'll get a, a speaker's gift out to you. I think I've got your address and uh, it's a really nice set of note cards that are uh, one of our members, Alan Dunham, uh, paints in watercolors and uh, these are prints of those paintings and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy them and be able to use them. So once again, thanks Dan and stay on the line. Uh